All right, so I, I'm told I don't have to like completely cut 20 minutes out of my lecture, but that I should move along. So I'm going to do my uh, Robert Watson imitation. We're going to hook really quickly. <laughs> All right, so this is the structure of, of ZFS. And there's uh, sort of two layers that we want to look at here. At the bottom, below the, the lower dotted line, we have what's called the object set layer. Uh, and the objects that are in that layer are the things like file systems or a snapshot or a clone or a zvol or whatever. And then the, between the two dotted lines there is the meta object set layer. And that's the, if you will, the pool. That's the, the, the big pool of all the blocks. In particular, uh, you'll see off on the right there a thing that says space map. And that's the thing that actually keeps track of all of the, the blocks, whether they're what the state of them is, i.e. allocated or not allocated. And in this uh, uh, picture, any place where you see this sort of triangle thing, that represents a set of indirect blocks. Uh, so for example, down at the bottom here, you see uh, the object set in this case is going to be a file system. Uh, the, first, the, 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 the row below that is all the inodes. So the, the triangle there. Uh, represents the, you know, the fact that the inodes, you can logically think of them in a, as in a big file. Uh, you know, you need more inodes than you have, you just make the file bigger and add more inodes at the end of it. Uh, and so, of course, you need a set of indirect blocks because that can be an arbitrarily large file. Uh, then in that set of inodes, you see there's an example of a file, and of course, files need indirect blocks, typically, to describe the, the user data that's in that file. Uh, unlike UFS, where you have direct blocks, single indirect, double indirect, triple indirect. Uh, in the case of ZFS, uh, the, the, it, you have a single type of indirection. So if you can reference the file with a single block pointer, then it's just a direct block pointer. Uh, there's only one block pointer in that inode type thing, uh, for reasons that will become clear shortly. Uh, and so as soon as you, you can't fit it into a single block, which is typically 128 kilobytes, then you, you replace that block with a pointer to an indirect block. And then the indirect block references data. And if you run out a point of indirect, single indirect block pointers, you create a double indirect block. You get it to point to that single indirect that you had before. And then you start creating more single indirects. So you just sort of keep upgrading. Uh, you know. Either you have a direct block pointer, or you have a pointer to single indirect, or you have a pointer to double indirect. Uh, so for different files, they'll have different numbers of levels of, of indirect block pointers, but it'll all be a, a fixed, a single type of uh, thing for any given file. And uh, the, the first node is always the master node, which is where we just store stuff about the file system. Uh, and then you just have the usual things you'd see, directories and files and symbolic links and so on very much like you would expect to see in a typical UFS file system. And so that object set there that sort of points to the, the, the inodes, if you will, uh, is kind of like the super block for a typical UFS file system. And then in the meta object layer, again, you have a thing which just has a pointer to a bunch of things that describe all the different things that you have there. So again, you have a master that keeps track of general stuff. And then you can see in this picture, we have a thing that references a snapshot, a zvol, a file system, a clone, et cetera. Uh, the one thing is that out at the end there, we have the, the space map. But again, it's, it's an extensible structure. And if you, need, you, know, you decide to create some more snapshots and we need some more entries there, we just make it bigger, uh, just like a file would grow. And so then the, the object set there at the top of the meta object thing is the thing that describes all of the different things that are in this particular pool. And then finally, uh, the thing that references that is the uber block. So a lot of people think of the uber block as a super block, but it's really it's sort of a, it's more than a super block because it's keeping track of all of the file systems in the pool. And when we take a checkpoint, what we're going to checkpoint is that uber block. So when you take a checkpoint, you are taking a checkpoint across all of the file systems, uh, snapshots, et cetera, that are in the entire pool which means essentially taking a checkpoint gives you that consistency across all of your file systems. It's not just that you're checkpointing a particular file system. All right. Block pointers. Uh, 
One of the uh, other ZFS developers, not Matt, um, described it as the Titanic of block pointers. Uh, as you can see here, uh, it is, uh, what's that, 128 bytes uh, in a block pointer. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we don't mess around. You know, in, in, when we went from UFS 1 to UFS 2, we went from 16 or 4 byte block pointers to 8 eight byte block pointers and we thought, oh my goodness, think of all that wasted space. Doesn't hold a candle to what we've got here. Okay, so what in fact do we actually have in this block pointer? Well, you'll see that we, the, the, there's sort of three things there that are, look pretty much the same. So we have uh, sort of, it takes two rows here uh, to actually describe where a block is somewhere in the pool. Uh, the, there's the VDAV which tells you sort of which disk it's on, uh, and uh, then you have the offset, and that's the, the block on that particular disk. So you, uh, you have the disk and that block pointer, uh, and then the, you'll notice that we have a number of different sizes here. Uh, we have the A size, the P size, and the, the L size. So we have a, a logical size, a physical size, uh, and the allocated size. Um, and the, uh, the other thing you'll see over there is uh, a little G, which is just a flag. Uh, what sometimes happens is if your disk gets too full, your pool gets too full, uh, you, you may need, let's say, a 128K block, but you don't have any 128K blocks left anywhere. Uh, and so then you have to essentially take some smaller pieces and sort of glue them together to make your, uh, your larger 128K block. And then there's a thing called a gang block, which just describes, it's like, well, this particular block is made up of this, this, and this piece. Uh, and so if, if this pointer actually uh, has to reference a number of pieces to make up the block, then the, the gang block bit will be set there telling you that's, that's what's going on. Naturally, you want to try and avoid doing that if you can. And here you can see how we do the redundancy. Uh, if we need redundancy, then we've got the VDEV2 and VDEV3 and offset2 and offset3. So that's where we keep the extra copies. Uh, so if it's just a, you know, a, there's no redundancy, then uh, those, the VDEV2 and 3 will be empty. Uh, if you have a single, you know, is it two, a double redundant, or, you know, single bit of the redundancy, two blocks, then VDEV1 and VDEV2 will point to, you know, there's copy one and there's copy two. And ZFS tries to split that across different disks. So it'll try to you know, put one copy on one spindle and an, another copy on another spindle. And if you have triple redundancy, then VDEV3 will also be filled in. And again, it'll try and put that on a third spindle uh, so that you have copies sort of spread out, and not just all uh, on the same drive. Now, obviously, if you've only got one drive, then they all obviously have to be on the same drive. But, uh, so it's not guaranteed that they'll be split, but it'll try and do that if it can. And you'll notice then down at the, the last four lines there is the checksum. And that's the checksum for the block. And of course, the checksum should come out the same for all three of those blocks. So we only need one checksum because even though we've got three copies, they should all come out with the same value of when we checksum them. Uh, but this, again, here we have stored the checksum separately from the data. If we read in you know, one of the copies and the checksum fails, our first first option is to see if we have a redundant copy and, and pull that redundant copy in and see if that checksum works. And if it does, then we say, okay, well, that's the crap copy. This is the good copy. And we'll just, you know, update that other one that's obviously wrong to fix it. Uh, and uh, if, you know, we're lucky enough to have one where we've got triple redundancy there, we can read in all three and then sort of have voting. Well, those two agree that with the checksum and that one doesn't, so it's clearly the outlier. Uh, we have other backups if there's, you know, this is not, there is no redundancy, there's just a single uh, pointer, a single block allocated for this block pointer, then we have to fall back to uh, if, if we have RAID or mirroring or some other thing uh, as, as a way of recovering that data. Okay, um, we keep track of the birth time of the block uh, and the, the birth time is uh, essentially when this thing got allocated. Uh, and in terms of this, it's not actually a timestamp. Uh, rather, what happens is each time we take a checkpoint, we increment our checkpoint counter. So we start off with checkpoint one, checkpoint two, checkpoint three, checkpoint four, 
And so if we've taken checkpoint four and now a block gets allocated, um, that's going to first be part of checkpoint five. Uh, and as you'll see later when we are trying to figure out when blocks can be freed, uh, we need to know when it came into existence. Uh, the only reason that we need to have two different times there is when we're doing deduplication because a block first gets created when it first comes into existence. There may be then uh, other references to it that are coming from essentially things that have been deduplicated. And so uh, we have the second time, which is when, th when it came into existence as part of this file as opposed to when it came into existence for the first time. Okay, uh, and then there's a bunch of other stuff like if, uh, what, what, which algorithm we're using for the checksum and if we're doing compression, which algorithm we're using for the compression. And uh, the physical and logical sizes may be different. The, the logical size might be 128K, but the actual physical size could be smaller because we're doing compression on it. Uh, so, you know, it, it's logically 128, but it actually it's only 48 uh, that it's actually being used after the compression happens. Uh, and then the, the actual size can be bigger than the physical size because we may have gang blocks or other things that are um, making it bigger. And if, with RAID Z, we also have to take into an account for the, the parity blocks that are part of the RAID um, when we're considering how much space it's actually using on the disk. All right, so whenever I talk about a block pointer, this is what I'm talking about. And you can begin to see why we can't pack a whole lot of those into an inode because, well, <laughs> the inode would be really huge very quickly. Uh, and in fact, even with the, the indirect blocks, you, know, you only get, I think, 128 in a, in a typical indirect block. I have to go back and do the math. But the point is, uh, anytime we talk about a block pointer, this is what we're talking about. This is how we, we carry on the checksums, how we do all of the redundancy. Okay, I have said a lot of the block management stuff already. Uh, all the disk blocks are kept in the big pool, uh, and then the multiple file systems and snapshots and clones and all Z vols, et cetera, are all just objects that are within that pool. Uh, and so the blocks from the pool are given to the file systems uh, as they're needed, and they get reclaimed to the pool uh, when they're freed. And I've talked about how you can reserve space and or put quotas on space uh, to make sure that file systems can get space if if they're going to need it, uh, and to make sure that they don't use all of the pool space. So to take that picture that we just looked at and drill down a little more deeply into it, um, this is, you know, I've sort of exploded some of those uh, abstract objects that I showed you before. Uh, D nodes are the, the structures which uh, are sort of, if you will, the closest that we have to the notion of an inode. Uh, D-node is sort of a more generalized structure, and so you can see that they get used for various and sundry other purposes there. Oh. Did I, I just want to, might be the battery, I don't know. Did I maybe not turn it fully on? No, it's on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> uh, so, so D nodes are these sort of generalized things that uh, they really can track lots of stuff, and uh, they have like what they call a bonus buffer in them. And so, if it's representing something that's uh, in in their notion a POSIX file, then it'll the, the, it'll have the sort of stuff that you need to keep track of of where the file like owner and group and mode and all that kind of thing. Um, in other places. Uh, where it's, it's you know, sort of describing something that's part of a, uh, a file system, then it'll have data set, which is uh, a sort of different set of information that, you know, it's keeping track of snapshots and so on. Okay, so uh, you can see sort of several examples here. Over on the right-hand side, um, we have the, the, the object set, which makes up the file system, and it, it sort of has three D nodes associated with it. Uh, two of them are used for the user and group quotas, and then one is the thing that tracks the, the file that makes up all of the logically inodes in the file system. And then, of course, they just have file data underneath them, as you might expect. Uh, you'll see the little pointers off to the side there where it says ZIL. Uh, and that's the ZFS intent log. One of the issues with ZFS, it, even though it's always consistent, 
there's a lot of changes that accumulate uh, before we take a checkpoint. And as you'll see when I go through what's involved in taking a checkpoint, you'll see that that's a fairly heavyweight thing to do. And so we have to keep track of what happened since the last checkpoint if we want to make certain promises out to applications. In particular, if you do an f-sync, when the f-sync system call returns, that says, I promise that the data for this file is on the disk, and it will be there after a crash. Well, you'd say, well, it's easy. You just take a checkpoint anytime someone does f-sync. Well, when you see what's involved in taking a checkpoint, you'll understand that that's a non-starter. And so we have to have some other way of providing f-sync short of taking a checkpoint. And the way we do that is with the intent log. Uh, so there's, uh, when you do an f-sync, we essentially make sure that all the information that we need to make sure that that file is there is written out into the intent log. And then what will happen is after a crash, we of course get the checkpoint, which is a completely clean file system. We then just walk through the, the intent log doing all the things that it says, you know, create this file, delete that file, blah, 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 blah. Uh, then we, once we get to the end of the log, we can take a checkpoint, and now the log is committed, and the file system is consistent, and everything is exactly as you would expect it to be. So um, anytime you have one of these things that can be modified, if you need to be able to ensure consistency of it, uh, you, we have the intent log to do that. OK, uh, so some other things you can see here. Uh, if, if you had a file system or clone, it would look like this. Uh, when you take a snapshot, it looks a lot like one of those file systems, but since it doesn't change, we don't, for example, need to have an intent log associated with it. Um, we don't need to have user or group quotas. Now, in fact, we actually do keep a frozen copy of those because if you decide to make a clone, then you need them anyway. Um, but I didn't put them in this picture because there wasn't really room for it. Uh, with a Zvol, a Zvol is just supposed to look like a disk, a raw disk partition. Uh, and so it, it only needs two nodes. Uh, one is the master node to keep track of stuff as usual, and the other is a file that represents the raw disk partition that we are uh, representing. Uh, but unlike a, a regular raw disk partition, it has all of the properties that you would expect from ZFS. So you can take a snapshot of your raw disk partition. Uh, and that's you know, sort of hard to do, typically, with your typical raw disk partition. Uh, so, you know, you get extra functionality out of it that you wouldn't get if, it were, if you were actually just using uh, a raw disk partition. In particular, uh, it's, they're popular with databases. You get the database to get itself to a consistent state, then you take a snapshot, and there you have it, then a snapshot of your, your database. All right, uh, so then above in the metadata layer, you can see the uh, each one of these objects that we have, each file system or zvol or whatever, uh, has a, a, a D node which uh, has a data set which represents it. Um, there is a, also a, a dir node. Um, and directories, uh, there's this, this whole infrastructure which is essentially a, a, a database, a, a key value pair database. Um, and so that gets used for directories like when we're implementing files, but it's also used for lots of other things like keeping track of the, the, you know, all the snapshots that are associated with a particular file system you know, and what the order is from you know, youngest to oldest and uh, all this sort of thing. And so uh, you'll, each, each thing like a Zvol or a file system or clone that has the ability to have snapshots associated with it is going to have one of those dir nodes uh, associated with. The snapshot itself doesn't need that because it's just a, a snapshot. Okay, so again, uh, oh yeah, and you'll notice then also the space map, of course, uh, you know, isn't, it has to be an extensible data structure because it's got to be, you know, however big uh, the amount of the, the, the data space is that we need to keep track of. Uh, it looks a lot like a, like a bitmap that you'd see in UFS where you, you know, you have a bit per block, more or less. Okay, uh, so let's, let's start with, or let's proceed on to what's involved in taking a checkpoint. Uh, while you are running along on your ZFS file system, we're just collecting all of the updates in memory. So it's just like blah, 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 more and more stuff accumulates. 
Uh, and then at some point we decide that it's time to take another checkpoint. And uh, so what we're going to do is collect together all the changes that have happened. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Uh, but we collect all these things together, and we write them all out to some unused space. Because remember, we're never going to overwrite anything. And then the very last step, after we've gotten all that there, and all the I.O. is completed, and the disks have come back and said they're done, and you say, are you lying to me? And they go, no, we really put it on the disk, and et cetera. Uh, then uh, we say, OK, now we can update the Uber block. And if you look at something sort of the uh, waffle, some, the network appliance one, they really just have two of these Uber block equivalents. And they just alternate writing one or the other. And you just look and see which one is the newer one, and that's the current checkpoint. Uh, ZFS is a little more paranoid about this. Uh, and so for every disk that you have, they allocate a, a, a set of 256 Uber blocks at the front and back of every single disk. Uh, so if you've got a pool of uh, five of these, or let's see, yeah, five, uh, right, you know, five disks in your RAID array, then you've got 10 different areas that have Uber blocks. And uh, anytime we need to update it, we pick, I think, like at random, three different uh, of these areas, and we write. Uh, you know, th there's like a, a, a circular pointer. We update sort of the next one in the in those three places. So in fact, to find the the most up-to-date Uber block is that you have to read the front and back of every disk in your pool, and then sort of put them all together and walk through and look at all of them and find out. All right, what's the newest out of all of these things? Uh, and that's your Uber block. So it's a little bit of work, but I mean, you know, it's not that bad. Uh, but the point is that there's, you know, they, they just are sort of paranoid to uh, fairly high level, uh, uh, you know, making sure that they don't lose that Uber block. Uh, OK, so uh, we do the checkpoint. And as, I, as I've already said, the checkpoint affects everything in the pool. So when we take a checkpoint, we are checkpointing uh, you know, all the Z-balls, all the file systems, all the, the clones, uh, all at once. OK, I've talked about how we need to log the changes between the checkpoints uh, to make sure that we can deal with things that need to be persistent. Uh, and the recovery, we'll talk a little bit more about, but you just essentially walk through the thing and, and apply them. OK, so now I want you to understand why it is that checkpoints are expensive. Now, uh, admittedly, this is like the worst case scenario. This is where you update one byte in one file, uh, and this is what you need to do. Now, obviously, you update a lot of different files, and a lot of the higher level stuff here is going to you know, only change once per checkpoint. But here's what happens. We've got this file uh, that's shown here. And so where it says step one, we add the byte to the end, you know, to the end of the file. Uh, well, of course, that changes that data block. So we can't just add that byte to that data block because, well, we can't change anything. So we're going to have to allocate a new block uh, to hold you know, the, you know, copy the 127k to, and then put the last, you know, two, three bytes that you're going to add at the end of it. OK, so now we have a new data block. Well, the indirect block pointer still points at the old block. So we're going to also have to update the indirect block pointer that now points to this newly allocated block. And of course, the indirect pointer that points to that indirect block has to be updated, da 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 da, -da all the way up. And of course, then the pointer in the inode for the file has now changed, along with probably some size information and timestamp and other things. So we need a new copy of the inode. Well, we can't update that inode, so we have to allocate a new block of the inode file that happens to contain that particular inode. Uh, so we'll do that. But then, of course, the indirect block pointer for the has to change, and its indirect block pointer has to change, da 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 da, da all the way up through step four there, uh, to the object set. And of course, it now has to point to the new indirect block pointer. So we have to you know, re update that thing, which of course then means that the file that, that's at the bottom of the meta object layer there in step six has to change, and then blah, 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 through step seven through all the indirect pointers. Uh, and then if, the thing at the top there, the object set, has to be replaced. Uh, so yeah. you start doing the math, 
you know, we might have to write a megabyte worth of stuff to update one byte. Okay, now, obviously, you know, you're probably going to be adding a lot of data to that file, and, you know, all that would have happened even if we had, you know, made huge changes to the file. If we changed other files in that file system, then, you know, if those two inodes happen to be close together, then again, there would be no additional stuff going on. So the reason that we want to collect together changes between checkpoints is because there's sort of this initial really high cost of making a change, but then as we do more stuff, the, you know, what actually has to change is more and more just the stuff that's actually changing and less and less of all the meta stuff that's in between it. But you can see why it would not be reasonable every time you did an f-sync to take a checkpoint. Because if we did that, we'd get clobbered. So this is why we need to, to have the zil. Uh, OK, so the, 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 sort of one of the, the, the issues that you have with a non-overwriting file system is you can't overwrite anything. It's not like, well, you're not going to overwrite the data, but it's OK to you know, overwrite some other things. The only thing that ever gets overwritten is the Uber block, and as we've already described, that's actually, uh, you know, there's many, many copies of it, so it's quite a while before any given Uber block ever gets overwritten again. All right, so the next thing that I want to look at here is RAID Z. And in this particular example, we have uh, five disks, disks one, two, three, four, and five. And it's kind of hard to see. Some of these are shaded. It, the, the, the picture alternates uh, shaded and unshaded to describe the blocks. So the first block that's in this picture is uh, all of stripe one and all of stripe two. And then the next block that got allocated is the first four blocks of stripe three. And then the next block after that that got allocated is uh, the last block in, in stripe three. And then the next first three of stripe four, et cetera. So we're alternating shaded and unshaded. OK, the point here is that when we write a block to the RAID Z, the block is whatever the size of that particular block is. So we, the block pointer tells us how big the thing is that we're pointing at. Uh, and so you know, we allocate just what we need. So now you can see here that in, in this particular case, we're, we're doing a single level of redundancy. Uh, and so. Uh, we put down a parity block, and then we can have up to four data blocks that are associated with that particular parity block. Uh, so in the, for that first block that we have there, uh, it's actually got eight data blocks in it, which very conveniently then only needs two parity blocks. So you see D0, D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, D6, D7, uh, and then the two parity blocks that are P0 and P1. Uh, then on that next one, uh, it's only three blocks long, so D0, 1, and 2. Uh, so you've got parity 0 for D0, 1, and 2. Uh, and then you'll see that you know, the parity for the next block just happens to be on disk 5 in this particular case, because that's where the next available space was. Uh, and then you see it, D0, 1, and 2. Uh, then we have a very small block. It's just a single you know, D0. Uh, and of course, it needs its own parity as well. So one of the, the sort of drawbacks of RAID Z is that if you've got a lot of things that are tiny blocks, you have a lot of parity overhead. Uh, and where this is not normally an issue for ZFS because it likes 128K block si kinds of sizes. But when you have Z vols, if you've got the Z vol set to be an 8K block size, uh, you end up having a 50% parity overhead because everything is a parity plus a data block. Um, the other thing is you'll see a few cases here where there's just an X. So if you come down here to stripe 8, uh, you'll see that we have a, a something that's four blocks long. So it's D0, D1, D2, D3, uh, and it's parity block. But we never want to have an odd number of blocks uh, because the, the, the problem with that is that uh, if we didn't actually reserve that last one, we could end up with pieces of the disk that we could never use because they'd only be a, end up being a single piece. Uh, and you need a minimum, in this case, of two, have a parity plus a data. And if it's double parity, then you need a minimum of three. And triple parity, you need a minimum of four. And so you need to uh, make sure that you're never going to allocate in such a way that you're going to be left up with pieces that you won't be able to use. And so in this case, we always make sure that everything is in multiples of two blocks. All right. 
Now, the issue for this, of course, is that normally when you go to reconstruct a RAID array, you just put the disk in, and you don't need to know anything about what's on there. You don't need to know anything about the format of the file system, because you just read in, you know, the, the, in this case, the four good disks, and then figure out what the parity is, and compute it, and drop it into the, to the disk that failed, or calculate what the data block would be, and drop it into the disk that failed. In the case of ZFS, what we're going to do is we actually have to do essentially a find from the top of the tree and walk down through everything that's allocated because uh, we're going through block by block by block because you, we, you know, we need to know what the size of the blocks are and where they're located. Uh, so in the case of ZFS, it actually means that RAID reconstruction is fast if your pool isn't very full because we don't have to look at all the contents of all the disks. We only have to look at the stuff that was allocated in the file system. On the other hand, if in fact your pool is nearly full, it's actually slower than a traditional RAID because there's a lot of random access I.O. to run around and get all the stuff that we need in order to be able to walk the tree. Uh, so it, it, you know, depending on how full your pool is, it may take you more or less time uh, to reconstruct your RAID Z um, in the event of a failure. And this, I've already pretty much just said, um, we traverse all of the objects uh, and look at all of their block pointers and, and reconstruct the, the blocks. Okay. Uh, you'll notice that one of the benefits that we do get with RAID Z is unlike the traditional RAID, we never have to uh, read in and recompute the parity and write it back out because everything that we're writing is exactly the size of the block. It's you know, some number of data blocks, some number of parities and we just write it down there. With a fixed size block in a, in a traditional RAID, if you're not writing the whole stripe, then you've got to read in the parity and recompute it and put it back. Uh, and so uh, it, this never needing to recalculate the parity uh, is, is a, one of the big benefits that we get um, with RAID-Z, cutting down on the amount of I.O. that we need to do. Uh, the other thing is that we don't have to worry about the so-called RAID hole. Uh, again, this comes more from the, the fact that we're a non-overwriting file system. Uh, the RAID hole occurs when you go to update a stripe on a traditional RAID. You, of course, have to typically write stuff on some number of drives. Well, if you've written, let, let's say you need to write the whole stripe, so you've got to write all five spindles, and you've written three of them, uh, and then the power fails and you didn't get the last two written. Well, now you can't reconstruct that stripe because it's sort of half updated and half not updated, and you're screwed. So you have to uh, essentially have non-volatile memory or something so that you can keep track of the things that you haven't quite finished writing all of the RAID stripe uh, so that when you know, things come back, you can reconstruct those uh, pieces, essentially write them with their, their new value. Uh, now, of course, ZFS hasn't magically figured out how to write everything in, in perfect harmony, but the point is that it doesn't matter because when we're writing stuff out, we haven't taken the checkpoint yet. And so we're not going to take the checkpoint and update the Uber block until everything is written and all everything is completed. So if we get halfway through writing part of a, a RAID stripe, it doesn't matter because you know, it's not part of the actual file system itself until we do that checkpoint uh, update of the Uber block. And so the, the whole RAID hole thing and the non-volatile memory and, you know, dealing with power up and all that is just not a problem. Um, we just don't care. All right, so now we get to the really tricky bit, uh, and that is freeing blocks. Uh, this is one of the things where UFS really has kind of easy. It just says, uh, you know, you remove that file, great. Those blocks are free, put them back on the free list. End of story. Uh, and including snapshots, because snapshots, you know, they have their own references to the blocks, and that's all just fine. So when you remove the snapshot, those blocks associated with it get freed. In the case of ZFS, of course, uh, a block may be part of a bunch of things. It you know, may be part of a file system, but then there may be uh, copies of it that are uh, being referenced out of snapshots or clones or who knows what all. 
And so we need to keep track of everything that's claiming a block. And only when the last thing claiming a block is done with it can we actually free the block. So there's been a sort of a progression over time of how to do this. So when the very first uh, non-overwriting file system was done, which was at Berkeley, part of the LFS uh, project that uh, was in the very early uh, BSDs that came out, uh, we didn't try and keep track of uh, when blocks were freed. We just had a garbage collector. So when we sort of ran out of blocks that we knew were free, we would run the garbage collector over the file system and find out what wasn't being used and <laughs> create a new pool. And uh, made it easy. On the one hand, we didn't have to worry about it. But every time the garbage collector would run, the file system would get incredibly slowly. And there were all these papers written on how to make the garbage collection less obnoxious, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it was the thing that really kept that from being usable in a uh, production environment. So the next approach that got taken was with network appliance. And their approach to it was in the space map, instead of just having one bit per block, they have a 256-bit uh, set of, uh, for each block in the file system. So uh, for every block, they've got an array of 256 bits. The first bit in the, is the active file system. And then you have one bit for each snapshot uh, that you're tracking. And so if a snapshot you know, claims a block, then the, that bit is set. And only when the entire set of all the bits has gone to 0 uh, is, it, is the block actually free. Well, first of all, this means that when you go to create a snapshot, you've got to make a pass over your map to mark all the things that are being used. And uh, Secondly, you're limited in the number of snapshots you can have by however wide you make that bit array. So that was certainly an improvement over what Berkeley did, but it's still uh, snapshot costs were proportional to sort of how big things were, which is not what you really want. So one of the big innovations that ZFS made was to go to this scheme that I'm about to describe, which essentially you, go, you, you don't have to, to keep track of you know, in a bit array, which blocks are being used, we sort of allocate it into a particular file system, and, and then we have all our snapshots that are all linked together from youngest to oldest. And when the file system no longer cares about it, it just passes it down to the first snapshot and says, do you care? And if the snapshot cares, then it says, yes, I care. And so it sort of holds on to the token. And when it doesn't care, you know, it gets removed, so it doesn't care about it, it passes it down to the next snapshot, and it's what it gets passed down the chain. And when it gets to the oldest one, and the, if the oldest one doesn't care about it, and it sort of falls off the end of the wagon, then we say, OK, that block is now free. OK, now, that, that's logically what's happening. As you'll see, the implementation is um, slightly different than that. But to a first order approximation, that's what's going on. OK. so. As we say here, the blocks are getting tracked that are using uh, space maps. Uh, and then we have birth times. Uh, so part of the point of the birth time is we don't actually have to let it run all the way down the list. As soon as it gets to the point where all the snapshots that remain uh, came into existence before the birth time of this block, they clearly can't care about it. So at that point, we're done with it. OK, so we, ha we do have this thing called dead lists. And th this is the list of blocks that we're sort of tracking that we're, you know, we're trying to get rid of, but, or trying to free, but we haven't been able to do so yet. OK, so as I say, when a, when a block gets allocated, it gets a birth time, which is equal to the transaction number. So that sort of shows where it came into existence. And uh, over time, uh, snapshots are going to get taken. And they're going, as, you know, if, if that block is allocated in the main file system, then every snapshot that gets created since the birth time is going to reference it. And at some point, the file system deletes the file that references the block. And now we sort of have a set of snapshots that still care about it, which is starting from the birth time up to the, you know, whatever snapshot was just below the, the file system. And in essence, now what's going to happen is when all the snapshots that are in that range are gone, the block's going to be free. OK. Now, of course, the, the the file, the block may have been claimed, you know, well, when it was first was born, and it, you know, it may be in several snapshots. But then that file itself um, may have 
you know, had some modifications. So at that point, uh, now the, the file system doesn't care about it anymore. So again, we can have like a, a, a range of snapshots basically that still care about that block. And so that's the range that we're going to be tracking. Okay. Uh, so what we need to do is when a block gets freed, the trick is to figure out, you know, we're going to create one of these uh, little cookies that keeps track of the block, and it's going to be on a dead list, and this dead list, as I say, is, is, is going to work its way down. So this next slide here shows you the magic that is used to calculate whether or not a particular block is ready to be freed. So I'm going to sort of walk you through this slide, and you're going to be scratching your head at the end of it. Uh, and I recommend that you go read the book because it's actually in great detail. Uh, thanks to Matt, did a blog post on it and actually explained it, and then I turned that into English and put it in the textbook. <laughs> uh, so the issue is here, uh, we, we have this set of snapshots. So there's previous snapshot, this snapshot, next snapshot. And the next snapshot could actually be the, the live file system. Uh, at any rate, what we are going to do is we are deleting this snap. And now the question is, what gets to be freed? So we got four blocks in our picture here. We've got block A that got allocated back far, far ago in history. And it is no, as of the, you know, this snap, that's the last place that it got referenced. So nothing going forward from there uh, cares about it. And in fact, there's uh, hanging off of this snap is, uh, is, would be the dead list saying, you know, this, this block is dead as far as I'm concerned going forward. Uh, and now what's going to happen is that in the case of block A, well, this snap doesn't care about it, but there's still previous snap and other things still do care about it. So we obviously can't free it. Block B, on the other hand, its lifetime, the only lifetime it has is over this snap. So block B is going to actually be finally able to be freed, because this, this is the last thing that cares about it. Uh, we have block C, which is you know, far in the future to far in the past. And you know, the fact that we're going away, great. You know, doesn't, it has no effect. It's not on a dead list that we're looking at. Uh, you know, and at some point, the snap won't be there anymore. So it, as it starts working its way back, uh, you know, it'll get to next snap and, you know, then jump over at this non-existent thing and we'll deal with it with pre snap and so on. And then finally we have block D uh, and uh, there's, it, you know, there's a block that had a lifetime but it ended before this snap. Um, so you know, other than the fact that it's, it happens to be hanging around on this snap's dead list, it's just going to end up hanging around on uh, pre snap afterwards. Okay, so we're going to iterate over um, next snap's dead, dead list. Uh, which is going to have on it blocks A and B. Uh, and A was born before pre-snap, so it just gets added to this snap's dead list. Block B was born after previous snap, so it actually gets freed. Uh, and then we're going to move, you know, we, we've taken the de dead list that's up there, we've moved it back to here. Uh, this is going to go away, so it's going to be handed over to previous snap uh, uh, so that it, you know, it will deal with it when it goes away. OK, uh, and so then we remove this snap from the list of snapshots, uh, and it gets removed from the directory about that's tracking the snapshots. Uh, the key takeaway from all this is we never need to make a pass over the entire block allocation map. The only thing we have to deal with is the, th the blocks that are on that dead list. Now, that can be a big list if a lot of stuff has been deleted. You know, you do a, a bulk delete of you know, 50,000 files, there's going to be a lot of blocks on that dead list. Okay, so don't get the impression that it's, oh yeah, a few blocks and we're done. No, uh, it actually, it's kind of, there, there's some very interesting algorithms that are in uh, ZFS in order to make processing big, long dead lists uh, more efficient um, because those lists can potentially be long. But we are never at the point where we need to make a pass over the entire space map. And the size of that dead list is never going to be bigger than the amount of space that's allocated in the file system itself. So you, know, you may have a ginormous pool, but if you've got a file system that's only 5% of the size of the pool, the most blocks you're ever going to have to deal with is 5% of the size of the pool. And that's where you, know, you essentially did an RM minus RF from star, so, uh, which isn't something you typically do intentionally. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, as the, the famous comment in the Unix code says, you are not expected to understand this, but this is really cool stuff. And you know, if you really want to sort of drill down on what I think is the most interesting of the algorithms in ZFS, um, go, go study this a bit more. Because it really, it's the thing that really sets ZFS aside from everything that came before it. I actually had to make that in a legal deposition, but that's another story. <laughs> OK. so. In an effort to try and finish this up in a reasonable amount of time, I want to just sort of summarize um, ZFS strengths and ZFS weakness. Uh, the strengths, first of all, high write throughput. When you have an overwriting file system like UFS and you're doing writes, you're running all over the disk. You're writing a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit up over here and so on. And if you're, ac if you're writing to a bunch of files, you spend most of your time running around on the disk getting to the place you want to write. With ZFS, we just pull all this stuff together and just go flomp in one place. It, we're writing temporally. So all the changes that have happened uh, over the period of the, the checkpoint, in theory, can all just go in one big huge write. Now, it doesn't actually happen that way, but it, you know, it, it tends to get written nearby each other. And so you just go write, 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 write. You may be writing tons of these little teeny weeny files, but all those blocks are right next to each other. Boom, 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 boom. And so we just get in there, write it down, and we're done. So we can get enormous write throughputs, even for workloads that would absolutely drive an overwriting file system nuts. OK. We get very fast RAID Z reconstruction when we have pools that I am told are less than about 40% utilization because of the fact we don't have to read all of all the disks. We just read the 40% that needs to be reconstructed. Um, I've talked about the RAID hole. We don't have it. Uh, blocks move between file systems as needed. You don't have to be clairvoyant and figure out you know, what your users are going to do next month. Uh, you, know, you suddenly get some new project and they need a huge amount of space. Well, you just give it to them out of the pool. No, you sell it to them out of the pool. <laughs> uh, and there's a whole. You know, ZFS is this, it's monolithic. It's, it's, you know, it covers a huge chunk of the kernel. Uh, and, but the, you know, I don't like that from a modularity point of view. But it means that you can do things that you can't do when things are independent. Like RAID Z, because RAID Z is integrated with the file system, we don't have to have fixed size stripes because they work together with that. Other things like administrative stuff keeping track of all your mount points. It's like you say, great, I can have 2,000 file systems. Do you really want to keep track of the et cetera FS tab for that? No, I don't really think so. And so ZFS will just deal with that for you. And it just knows how all the file systems are mounted within the pool. And it's just like, OK, fire up the pool, blah, 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 blah. Everything's there. And it you know, makes life a lot easier. OK. So of course, there's the flip side. Uh, because we're writing temporally, it means that any file that gets slowly written, like let's say a log file that gets you know, a kilobyte written to it every hour or so, it's going to be all over the disk. In UFS, it's going to be in one place. So if you decide to grep your log file, boom, it's right there. Whereas in ZFS, it's you know, a little here, a little there, a little over there. So uh, if it doesn't happen to be in the cache, it's going to take a long time to read that, which is the flip side, why does LFS want, or ZFS want such a huge arc, a huge cache? It's because you, in order to get good read performance, it's got to be in memory. So you've got to be able to keep everything that you're actively working, reading in memory because a lot of it is not going to be laid out optimally to go get it off the disk. Uh, if you run your pool more than about 40% full, and again, don't take, hold me too close to this number. Uh, you know, somewhere in that range, uh, you are going to, it's going to take longer to reconstruct your RAID Z than it would take you to reconstruct the traditional uh, RAID. Uh, the block cache has to fit in the kernel's address space. It, it, in the case of UFS, it works well on 32-bit processors because it just maps in blocks that it needs. So, the, you know, the kernel has like a little bit of its address space that's dedicated to, to looking at stuff, and it just maps in the blocks as it needs it. There's nothing that would prevent the ARC from doing that, but it's not set up that way. When ZFS was written, they're like, look, 
we're just going to run on 64-bit processors. So we're just going to be able to map all the physical memory into the kernel, and we'll be done with it. We're not going to have all this extra overhead of mapping stuff in and out and all that nonsense. So the flip side of that is you really want a 64-bit processor to run ZFS because it, it really, I mean, the previous D project spent a huge amount of time trying to make it work well on the 32-bit the, the processors. And to their credit, whoever you out there that figured out all those magic tunings, um, it did a pretty good job. But there was still a like, well, you know, you do this and this and this, and the machine locks up. Uh, and so you know, that my, my attitude is, look, just get a 64-bit processor, and then you'll be happy. Uh, it does not work. It, it wants you to stay below a certain level of utilization. Uh, I've been told that I'm being too pessimistic at 75%. But as you get too close to full, it no longer it, it has the big blocks that it wants, and it starts having to chain stuff together in gang blocks and other things. Uh, I had uh, Brendan Gregg came and gave the last lecture for my class about performance. And uh, he had some interesting things to say about ZFS. He said, there's, uh, when you're analyzing it, there's sort of two completely different parts of the ZFS brain uh, that show up in a D-trace. There's the, I'm happy and have enough space, and I'm sad I don't. Uh, and uh, he says, you can just look and see where D-trace shows you you're spending all your time, and you know whether you're in the happy or sad zone. Uh, uh, and uh, you, you want to stay out of the sad zone, because it does tend to slow down. Uh, on the other hand, again, you've got a giant system. Disks are not that expensive. Just go keep enough disks so that you don't, you don't stress it out with like 90% full. If you want to do 90% full, go use UFS. OK. Uh, RAID Z has a high overhead for small block sizes, uh, 4K blocks or 8K blocks, which some get used on Z vols because of the parity, where you have 50% parity overhead uh, when it's this, the, the block size is the same as the parity block. Uh, again, the optimal thing there to do is just use bigger blocks uh, on your Z-vols. Uh, and then finally, uh, the, the, the blocks that are cached in memory are not part of the unified memory cache. So in the case of UFS, it's integrated with the VM system. And so any copy of a data block for a file, there's exactly one copy, whether you mmap it, whether you read and write it, whether you're send filing it, or whatever. In the case of ZFS, it doesn't, it's not part of that game. And again, if you want to, the details of why that is, you can go read it in the book. But uh, the ARC is uh, it's a separate pool. It's back in the days where there was the buffer cache and there was the VM pool. And this means that if something is mmap, there's a lot of back and forth to keep things coherent. In other words, you, you want to do a read, and it's like, oh, well, this might not be up to date, so it has to go check the, the VM pool. And if it's there, copy it over into the ARC and then give you the data. And so you get some extra memory to memory copies because of that. Uh, it's actually one of the, the, the last problem in the exercise set of chapter 10 is come up with a scheme to unify the, the ARC with the VM cache. Uh, and it's a double-starred exercise, which means it qualifies for PhD thesis if you can do it. <laughs> OK, so that is what I have to say. And I am, actually, I'm not over time if you give me credit for the time that we were out. <laughs> but no, was. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> was it just because it was getting too hot or? No, no.